Well, good afternoon to everyone. I'm Jeff Youngren. Uh, I get the honor of introducing someone who's uh, been a close friend and in many ways is my adopted daughter, Cassie Bonas, Dr. Cassandra Bonas, who is a research assistant professor at UNM's uh, Center for Substance Use and Addiction. Uh, Dr. Bonas and I met each other at the University of Missouri uh, about four years ago. Uh, she was an up-and-coming graduate student. Uh, we got together and wrote some papers on emotional support animals, which is her area of expertise beyond her expertise in, in addictions, uh, which is really her specialty. Uh, Dr. Bonas received uh, the Outstanding Dissertation Award from the University of Missouri and also received the Outstanding Dissertation Award from the American Psychological Association Division of Clinical Science, Division 12. Um, and uh, her most recent paper on emotional so support animals has uh, almost 8,000 reads. So uh, not, not a bad contribution to science. So with, without uh, in further ado, let me introduce one of my favorite people, Cassie Bonas. Thank you. Um, it's so nice to be here. Um, Dr. Youngren, as he mentioned, um, has been a great mentor of mine. Um, and we've primarily worked on research related to emotional support animals. So what I'll be talking about today is slightly different from that. Um, I actually had the pleasure of speaking in psychiatry grand rounds here in I think 2019 on that topic. So it was kind of nice to see um, the pictures from that a few years ago, like pre-pandemic um, and just see kind of how things have come full circle in many ways with now being um, faculty here. So I'm really thrilled to be here. It was always kind of a long time um, goal of mine to get here. Um, so I'm, I'm really thrilled to be with you today. So today I thought I would just tell you a bit about the broad themes of my research and areas of interest, as well as where I'm hoping to take my research in the future um, now that I'm here, I just started my position in September of last year, so I'm relatively new to UNM, still trying to um, kind of figure out all the ropes still. If you have um, comments or questions, I can't, I can't actually see that with my slides pulled up, um, but feel free to put questions or comments in there and I'll, I'll be glad to address them at the end. Um, you can also feel free to hold your, your questions till the end as well. I'll give plenty of time for that. Um, so today I'll be talking a bit about shifting our conceptualizations of alcohol use disorder or AUD as I'll refer to it from clinical description to mechanisms. So much of my work in graduate school really focused critically on the DSM-5 diagnosis of AUD and really substance use disorders more generally. The DSM-5 defines alcohol use disorder and substance use disorders by 11 separate criteria. These are summed together to conceivably indicate some sort of severity of a substance use disorder. And what that means is the more criteria you endorse, the more severe um, you are thought of a substance use disorder you are able, um, you're classified with. Sorry, it just showed me that my screen is now being shared. So hopefully you can see my slides. Um, so in many ways, the DSM-5 alcohol use disorder diagnosis reflected progress. I mean, especially compared to earlier versions, and specifically progress with regards to improving the validity of the alcohol use disorder construct. So the ability to actually measure what we think we're measuring. However, DSM-5 and specifically the alcohol use disorder diagnosis remains plagued with several problems. So these problems of which there are several, but I'm just gonna cover four today. Um, that are really key to my research and have really driven my program of research recently. Those are um, first an adequate construct validity of the DSM-5 AUD diagnosis and its symptoms, high degrees of within disorder, so within an alcohol use disorder diagnosis, high degrees of heterogeneity, a failure to explicitly consider the etiologic mechanisms that lead someone to develop an alcohol use disorder or perhaps maintain an alcohol use disorder, and then substantial comorbidity with other forms of psychopathology. Um, so I'll just give a quick kind of overview of each of these. Um, and again, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. I'm happy to elaborate more. I'm just gonna go through them quickly for the sake of time. 
So first let's talk about this idea or this, um, this challenge with validity, with construct validity, specifically with the DSM-5 AUD diagnosis and its symptoms. So per the DSM-5, AUD criteria are intended or organized to fit into the overall groupings that are displayed here. So those include impaired control, social impairment, risky use, and then pharmacological criteria. These groupings were determined primarily based on expert consensus rather than like empirical classification, for example. So what I mean by that is that the signs and symptoms of alcohol use disorder were determined by experts. And of course they considered the literature in this, the, the evidence for um, their decisions. But I think what's really important here is that all of us, expert or not, carry with us different backgrounds, traditions, and biases. And this is known as authoritative rather than empirical classification. And this is something that I'm just really fascinated by and think is really important when we talk about diagnoses of psychopathology. And interestingly, these groupings really do appear to be more conceptual than empirical. So in a recent um, secondary data analysis from my thesis work at University of Missouri, um, this was led by Dr. Ashley Watts, who's still at the University of Missouri, we actually were not able to replicate the DSM-5's conceptual structure that you see here. Instead, we found these groupings that you see. So we saw perhaps two higher order factors, um, urge, difficulty controlling use, and then tolerance and consumption that then bifurcated into kind of lower level or more fine grained um, symptoms. And for urge and difficulty controlling use, those were withdrawal and preoccupation and loss of control. And for tolerance and consumption, those were more specifically tolerance and then consumption or recovery from the effects of the consumption or using. So not exactly consistent, right? Not, not entirely different, but there's enough discrepancies here to say that, you know, perhaps this conceptual model isn't actually holding up. And maybe you're thinking of logical questions like, what was your sample? How many items did you have? And so on. These are good questions. They're questions that I would ask too. But what I really want to emphasize is that the structure that we found here has been found by other groups as well. So other groups led by people like Dr. John Crabb, Ken Kendler, they also look at kind of the genetic level, the genotypic level. So we're looking at phenotypic level here, self-report. They've found similar patterns as we see here in genetic data. So I don't necessarily think I'm well suited to argue that these are like the groupings that you know should be adopted by the DSM-5 um, without a doubt. But I do think I'm well suited to argue that the DSM-5's conceptual groupings that you see up top here don't actually seem to hold up empirically. And this calls into question the validity of the symptom domains that are articulated by the DSM-5. And a related, perhaps more tricky or nuanced issue is the mixing of fundamental features or primary features and secondary or accessory features of alcohol use disorder. Fundamental features would be those that are specific to and present throughout the course of an alcohol use disorder. So something like craving, for example. Secondary features are those that arise from an alcohol use disorder or maybe as a result of alcohol use disorder. This might be psychosocial consequences like failure to fulfill role obligations, missing work or school. This is further, even further complicated by staging. And what I mean by staging is that whether a given symptom defined by the DSM-5 diagnosis is pre-existing or pre-morbid or acquired as a result of prolonged consumption. So it's really often difficult to determine whether a given symptom arises due to chronic and excessive alcohol use and therefore is fundamental or primary or is due to some other factor. Again, perhaps further calling in to question the construct validity of AUD and perhaps more specifically what is unique to alcohol use disorder. So ultimately it's this mixing of these kind of fundamental or core processes with secondary features within a diagnosis that really suggests Again, some of the symptoms outlined by their current diagnostic systems like DSM-5 may actually only be distally related to the fundamental or core features of an alcohol use disorder. This likely compromises construct validity of a diagnosis and then also increases the likelihood of comorbidity 
by including features that might be multiply determined. Oh, I see people can mark on my slides. That's <laughs> new to me. Um, okay, so what I really want to highlight here is that this mixing, right, the mixing of the primary and the secondary features really creates a challenge for us when we're thinking about implications or applications. So if we're trying to think of determining the most effective prevention or treatment targets, for example, and these things that are showing up, like perhaps um, some sort of consequence related to alcohol use disorder that's in the criteria, this might actually obscure investigations into the causes of alcohol use disorder and addiction, because we might not actually be exploring anything that's fundamental to an alcohol use disorder. The next issue I want to highlight is this idea of significant heterogeneity of AUD diagnoses. So let me first kind of orient you to this figure. This is adapted from a paper by Sean Lane and Ken Scher at the University of Missouri, um, both of whom have really just influenced my thinking and in, in my line of research today. The x-axis here are the number of criteria endorsed. So out of the 11 possible AUD criteria, how many are endorsed? The y-axis reflects the possible combinations of a given number of criteria. So, for example, looking at the area under the curve, this would tell us that there are more than 2,000 possible combinations of the 11 criteria that are sufficient for diagnosing somebody with an alcohol use disorder. So to the diagnostic threshold or to be diagnosed with an alcohol use disorder, you need to meet for two or more criteria. When considering two criteria alone, again, which was a diagnostic threshold, there are still 55 different combinations of criteria for just two. As a result of this, two individuals could receive an alcohol use disorder diagnosis, but really have like no, no overlapping symptoms whatsoever or few overlapping symptoms. So the result of this, or the implications of this, is that those diagnosed with an AUD exhibit considerable heterogeneity in terms of their clinical presentation, right? So two people, both with an alcohol use disorder, walk into a clinician's office or a PCP's office. Those two people could have very different profiles. So this heterogeneity really extends to their profiles of risk, the course of their alcohol use disorder, so on and so forth. This within disorder heterogeneity is further complicated, of course, um, and it's further complicated by the fact that the DSM criteria are considered interchangeable, meaning that they contribute equally towards a diagnosis. So what that means is you can endorse any two criteria and they're thought to be you know, equal in terms of how um, severe they are. However, my work at University of Missouri and particularly my thesis work, really provided clear evidence that AUD criteria actually vary and sometimes considerably vary in their severities. So that different criteria cannot be assumed to be equivalent indicators of an alcohol use disorder. So what you're seeing here is a visual depiction of that point. This data is derived from a meta-analytic analysis by Sean Lane, who I mentioned before. On the x-axis, we have DSM-4, alcohol use disorder criteria. So abuse and dependence, what it was called previously. On the y-axis, we have the item response theory-based severity threshold. So what this threshold indicates is how severe of an alcohol use disorder someone would need to have before they'd be likely to endorse a given item or a given symptom. Items with higher thresholds, so as you move up the y-axis, conceivably require you to have a more severe alcohol use disorder before you're likely to endorse that item. So what we see here, this, this bold line and this, these plotted lines more generally are the different thresholds across different types of samples. So for example, a clinical sample versus community sample and whether the AUD criteria they're looking at apply to a past year diagnosis or a lifetime diagnosis. So without going too into the weeds on IRT methodology or all these data points, I really wanna highlight this bold line here. And this bold line that you see shows the median severity across the range of samples and um, timeframes for diagnoses for each of the AUD criteria. 
And what this figure really demonstrates is that the AUD criteria vary considerably in their severities and thus are not actually equivalent indicators of AUD as it's assumed. If the criteria had equivalent severities, meaning you'd be just as likely to endorse any of these 11 at the same level of an AUD, we might expect this line to be more flat or horizontal. But this variation we're seeing in kind of this upward trajectory is showing us that these criteria really do vary and cannot be considered equal. So arguably an individual who meets criteria solely on the basis of craving and withdrawal, which are towards the right hand side of this X axis and are at the higher end of severity are quite different from an individual who meets criteria solely on the basis of things like failed attempts to cut down or using in hazardous situations, which are on the lower end. So ultimately the challenges that we encounter as a result of this heterogeneity of these diagnoses really, again, could preclude kind of a thorough or comprehensive understanding of the development and the nature of the disorder, as well as impede prevention and treatment efforts. If we're just looking at the diagnosis level of alcohol use disorder, that tells us very little about a person's symptom profile, which this shows us is important to consider given they could vary considerably in terms of severity, for example. So by now you can probably gather that the overall groupings of the AUD symptoms aren't really replicable and may actually be more conceptual than empirical. Also an overall diagnosis of an alcohol use disorder doesn't actually provide us much information about a person's profile. As a result of that, and then as I mentioned previously, the mixing of the features, heterogeneity, an AUD diagnosis really tells us little about the etiology or the causes of a person's alcohol use disorder and or what mechanisms may have been at play in the development, or as I mentioned previously, the maintenance of an alcohol use disorder. Now, I'm gonna give a little bit of a history overview. Um, oh, I just knocked my light bulb out, sorry. Um, a history overview on DSM-5 and kind of what their position is on etiology, because I think it's important to think about, you know, where have we been? What has worked, what hasn't worked? And the DSM-5 really claims to be atheoretical. And really I should say the DSM more broadly, not just the DSM-5 with respect to the causes of addiction. So there are practical reasons for this, of course, and early editions of the DSM actually were not atheoretical. So I think the shift to an atheoretical approach really occurred around the DSM-3, which we phased out in, I think, 1952. So you might be asking yourself, you know, what are the pros and cons of both approach? Like, why does, why does this matter? What can we kind of take moving forward? And it's important, I think, to talk about what the goals were of shifting to this atheoretical approach and why that happened at the time. So shifting to this atheoretical approach and DSM-3 aimed at fulfilling three different goals. So they really wanted to kind of move beyond these, what they called ideological divisions and towards science. So they were trying to avoid maybe some of the debates about addiction or etiology or just general psychopathology, etiology. This atheoretical approach also aimed to kind of temporarily set aside these arguments about etiology and instead to focus on these kind of acute observable descriptions of mental disorders. And third, this shift really aimed to kind of reform the clinical vocabulary that was being used by kind of trying to avoid um, claims about the causes of mental events, for example, and purely try to be descriptive. So the, the idea here is that they really tried to move away from this kind of ideology, right? And towards more of reliability, things that were observed across different types of providers that could be you know, reliably diagnosed or um, symptoms could be reliably assigned across providers. But the way these historical rationales read is that it was never really meant to be a permanent solution for classification. They were not saying like theory is bad and has no place here. They were saying, we don't quite know enough and we really need to make progress at this moment in time. So since then the DSM became almost entirely descriptive and really 
just overlooks what is known about etiology now. So this kind of all or nothing approach to the etiologic theory, which has persisted since DSM-3, has in my opinion, in some ways now at least, stunted our ability to make progress. It therefore kind of remains unclear how multiple etiologic mechanisms are accommodated in the DSM-5. So does a given symptom represent one or multiple etiologic mechanisms? Does a single mechanism give rise to multiple symptoms? If alcohol use disorder comprises these etiologically distinct symptoms or kind of symptom domains, as I showed at the beginning, why is this alcohol use disorder diagnosis thought to be kind of a unitary construct um, without kind of these sub facets? These and questions like this have yet to be really addressed. Um, and the current diagnostic criteria really fail to explicitly probe mechanisms at all. So AUD criteria are likely to be missing important information, in my opinion. So really what I'm calling for here is a improved attention to etiology. And I think that this could help us improve AUD diagnosis such that it is actually more informative for things like treatment, right? We're better able to choose treatment targets based on somebody's profile. Um, and determine things like prognosis. So the final point I wanna highlight before moving on to my current work is the issue of substantial comorbidity with other psychopathology. So there's extensive comorbidity or sometimes referred to as diagnostic co-occurrence of alcohol use disorder with virtually all other disorders, including substance use disorders like nicotine use disorder, um, externalizing disorders, personality disorders, internalizing disorders. Um, really, this is kind of an ongoing challenge for psychopathology researchers and classification researchers. To demonstrate this, about 41% of men and 47% of women with an alcohol use disorder have also had a lifetime substance use disorder. There are many potential explanations for this. I, I could kind of give a whole talk on um, explanations for comorbidity or co-occurrence, but I really wanna highlight one specific reason that I think is especially relevant to AUD and to my research specifically. And that is the idea that comorbidity potentially reflects dysregulation in some higher order dimension, something like disinhibition or negative emotionality or reward dysregulation. And as I was putting this talk together, I was reminded of this great review by Kruger and Markon, which discusses this idea of multivariate comorbidity models, which is really kind of just a jargony way of saying that comorbidity probably arises from some common underlying core process that's depicted here, such that there's some A process that influences these diagnoses. And perhaps there's also some other B process that maybe only acts upon one of those. So the diagnostic co-occurrence that we're seeing is a result of this shared A process. So for instance, much of the variance in alcohol use disorder, as I mentioned, is shared with other forms of externalizing psychopathology. So maybe like antisocial personality disorder as an example. This likely arises from a shared A process, something like an underlying tendency towards disinhibition, being unable to kind of maybe inhibit a response. So regardless of the nature of the comorbidity observed between you know, AUD and these other disorders depicted here, it suggests that our current diagnostic approaches like the DSM-5 might not be actually capt accurately capturing what is distinct to AUD or as I mentioned before, what is fundamental or primary. So what do we do about it, right? The DSM has served us in many ways and in many ways it has not. So what do we do? Where do we go from here? A potential solution that I'm fond of is this idea that we can shift our conceptualizations of psychopathology away from clinical description or prioritization of reliability towards a focus on mechanisms and specifically etiologic mechanisms. Those can be cognitive, psychological, neurobiological, so on and so forth. 
Mechanism-based or mechanism-focused approaches also emphasize the importance of integrating translational work, which I think is really great. This refers to the application of findings from basic science um, to etiology, pathophysiology, trajectory of mental disorders, integrating science across units of analysis. And this is great because there's a lot that we do know about AUD and addiction etiology. So we don't have to be purely atheoretical anymore. So there are actually some relatively recent models of psychopathology that aim to do just this, that aim to shift more towards mechanisms, some of which you might be familiar with. Those include the research domain criteria, which are kind of oftentimes depicted as this matrix where we have different units of analysis across different types of domains of functioning or mechanistic domains. We have the National Institute of Drug Abuse's phenotyping assessment battery. And then one that's sometimes overlooked is HITOP or the hierarchical taxonomy of psychopathology. And this was largely um, kind of driven and developed by personality researchers. So although I don't have time to go into each of these, I really do believe that each of these represents significant progress in terms of classification. And largely because they're shifting away from this idea of clinical description towards mechanisms or what are sometimes referred to as kind of homogenous symptom clusters that kind of do away with diagnoses as categorical entities and say, what are kind of symptoms that tend to hang together and how do we then um, talk about diagnoses in a way that's characterized by these clusters of symptoms um, that aggregate empirically. So in the interest of time, I do wanna take a second to highlight one of these approaches and one of these conceptualizations. And that is the alcohol and addiction research domain criteria, or sometimes what we call RDOC. And then their corresponding addictions neuroclinical assessment or ANA. These serve as the first attempt in integrating addiction mechanisms into a comprehensive framework. The alcohol addiction RDOC is premised on the Kuban Lemal model of addiction. So if you're not familiar with that, just a brief overview. This model really describes addiction as an acquired stage-like process whereby following some sort of initial pleasurable effects that one experiences as a result of consumption or what is binge intoxication in the blue box on the left, that distress then results from short and long-term abstinence. So when the use stops, the abstinence occurs, this causes some sort of withdrawal or negative affect or emotionality as a result. That then leads to the preoccupation and anticipation stage, which is kind of this, you know, oftentimes where we would talk about craving this intense need to get the substance. And that is alleviated by use. This results in continued consumption, often at increasing doses. So this is sometimes talked about the stages of addiction, sometimes the spiral of addiction, it's, it's been called different things. What the alcohol addiction RDOC does is they identify three domains that map on to each stage of this addiction cycle. Those domains being incentive salience, reward, and executive function are sometimes referred to as cognitive control. And the corresponding addictions and neuroclinical assessment is a battery that aims to measure or assess dysfunction in these domains. So there's a lot of numbers here. This is, these are factor analysis results. And what I want you to, to see here is what each of these domains, what might be included under those. So for executive function, it might be things like impulsivity, lack of conscientiousness, negative emotionality might be depression, neuroticism, so on and so forth. However, these two frameworks, in my opinion, also suffer from some important limitations. I don't have time to go into all of them today, but there is one that really stands out to me, which is kind of the questionable empirical support for the model. And what I mean by that is that the factor analysis results I'm showing you here are not the most convincing. I'm not gonna go into the details of factor analysis today. Um, I'm happy to in the Q&A. But this is not the most convincing to show me that these three factors actually do emerge in the data. It also fails to consider some potentially relevant domains, 
It doesn't really consider the overlap that could occur between the domains. And it really focuses primarily on acquired mechanisms or processes that are at play in addiction as a result of focusing primarily on that stage-like process. And this leads us to my work and how I've really kind of taken what we know and the progress that has already been made and said, how can we continue to improve upon this? How can we improve our modern conceptualizations of addiction in a way that advances research, classification, and treatment? So that brings us to um, my dissertation work, which was mentioned at the beginning. And what I did here was I used an approach that not everyone is familiar with, but it's known as the systematic review of reviews approach. So this is useful when the goal is to efficiently examine the current state of evidence for a topic. So what I, the question I asked was, you know, we've largely determined the signs and symptoms of alcohol use disorder based on expert consensus. But have we ever actually like systematically gone to the literature and said, what is that? What are, what does the evidence say about the factors that lead somebody to have developed an alcohol use disorder or to maintain an alcohol use disorder? So that's why this approach is really relevant. So many of you are probably familiar with just the, the general systematic review approach. This is where you would integrate similar studies at the primary study level into a systematic review. The systematic review of reviews approach is really great when you really want to kind of survey a, a broad, more broad landscape of literature. There's been so much research conducted on the etiology of alcohol use disorder. If I worked at the primary study level, I would have never graduated. It would have taken me 10 years. Um, so instead I said, what's a more efficient way to do this? And that's how I developed or I came across the systematic review of reviews approach, which integrates information from systematic reviews into a larger synthesis. So I'm operating kind of here at the second level rather than at the primary study level. And this is an overview of all of the kind of manuscripts, the peer reviewed manuscripts that we came across several thousand. Um, after screening these for inclusion, going through all of the extensive coding and elimination and inclusion criteria, um, we ended up with 142 systematic reviews that were eligible for inclusion. I wanna highlight that this, this does not include book chapters um, or things that are not peer reviewed journal articles. So it's very key to keep in mind that we could be missing important information as a result of only integrating across um, these types of publications. So once we had all of the eligible reviews, I had a, a huge team of coders that I trained that then went through each of these reviews and identified the core ideologic mechanism or mechanisms, and then classified them into one of the three alcohol and addiction research domain criteria domains. So reward incentive salience, negative emotionality, or cognitive control. And in other cases, we also had an, an other option or none of these option, which would indicate the mechanisms in this review are not covered by the alcohol and addiction RDOC, which if you remember was an important goal of mine to say what might be missing here. So I spent countless months integrating this information, consulting experts, consulting reviews that were not included in this um, meta-analysis or this systematic review, excuse me, to, to resolve discrepancies when they arose. I, I spent many, many months trying to integrate this information. And the result of that was this hierarchical, hierarchical framework that integrates the ideologic mechanisms into several kind of levels of analysis with the more broad construct at the top and more fine grained levels of analysis as you go down. So this is a, a figure that represents the findings from that review. At the top level, we have alcohol use disorder. Um, some people refer to this as you know, harmful use, something to indicate that um, heavy and prolonged alcohol consumption. The next level down, we have three super domains. These are largely similar to what I've covered previously. So we have reward, cognitive control, also sometimes called executive function, and negative valence and emotionality. 
what I want to highlight is that these super domains are more broad than what we saw represented in the alcohol and addiction RDOC, and also in something like just the regular research domain criteria RDOC, and they are addiction specific. So the next level, we separate cognitive control into compulsivity and impulsivity. There's an ongoing debate in the literature about whether compulsivity is actually even relevant in alcohol use disorder. Some literature argues that compulsivity is kind of happens as a second stage. So impulsivity occurs first, that then transitions again with heavy and prolonged consumption into compulsivity. The literature is really out on compulsivity in my opinion, but there is a lot of support for it. So I included it kind of tentatively and the separation here is really meant to say, you know, let's do more targeted research on these constructs and whether they actually separate, whether they're both relevant in addiction. This then goes another level lower here. So it becomes more fine grained. And these are 13 mechanisms at the subdomain level. This is typically kind of where the meat of the review is coming from. So within reward, we identify processes or mechanisms such as positive expectancies, reward sensitivity, incentive salience, discounting, habit. Cognitive control includes things like compulsive use, conscientiousness or lack of conscientiousness, response inhibition. And then negative valence and emotionality includes things like punishment sensitivity, coping, negative emotionality, and negative expectancies. The idea is that dysregulation in these subdomain mechanisms or these 13 mechanisms identified here uniquely confer risk for alcohol use disorder in some way or the maintenance of alcohol use disorder in some way. At the lowest level, we have what we refer to as components. These are again, more fine green. So something like conscientiousness here in the middle could be separated into lack of planning and lack of perseverance. That's a pretty well-known kind of distinction in the literature on impulsivity and conscientiousness. So there's a lot to digest here. I'm not gonna go into what all of these are, what each of these means, but I'm happy to talk about it more at the end. Again, the idea here is that dysfunction in these domains and these mechanisms any, at any level of the hierarchy can provide us information about what causes an alcohol use disorder, what maintains an alcohol use disorder. What I haven't mentioned here yet is these kind of dash lines, what we would refer to as like cross loadings. For example, cognitive control has a dash line going to incentive salience. Incentive salience is primarily a reward related process and that it describes the kind of the shifting away um, from kind of natural rewards more towards alcohol or substance use related rewards or cues. So you start to kind of um, value cues associated with the substance, for example, more than natural reinforcers like um, food or sex. This is actually also influenced by cognitive control processes. So although it's primarily a reward related mechanism, it is influenced by cognitive control. And that is the case with many of these mechanisms. So that's what the dashed lines are indicating. And again, further areas for clarification and research. We also identify some critical moderators that are not described here. Um, those include self-awareness and opponent processes. So those didn't necessarily confer risk for AUD kind of alone, but they often act upon or moderate some of these mechanisms in the associate. They moderate the association between these mechanisms and an alcohol use disorder. So what I want to emphasize here is that this figure was really derived from the literature, from what is existing in the literature. I'm not trying to take a position on, again, compulsivity, for example. The debate is out on that. I wanted to include it to say, hey, can we do more targeted research to answer some of these lingering questions or debates in thinking about etiology? So why does it matter? How does this framework help us? You know. You said that you did this work because you wanted to improve upon other modern conceptualizations. There is some overlap. In some cases, it's more broad. How does this help us? Where do we go from here? Well, first, this can help us identify and contextualize research targets. As I mentioned, compulsivity could be a research target. 
a team that's doing research on habit, for example, which we know is really a core process in nicotine use disorder, perhaps slightly less so in alcohol use disorder, could say, you know, how can we really target this mechanism specifically and try to figure out if it does indeed fit into this framework in this way. Revised diagnostic criteria. So one of the mentioned things I mentioned before was challenges with having 11 different criteria and how many different combinations you can have of that. I realize I'm presenting three, 13 mechanisms here, which is more than 11. The point of this is that we can operate at this reward level, cognitive control, negative valence and emotionality, perhaps assess those domains with lesser, a lesser number of criteria. And if needed, then go on to develop and refine assessments that get at the more fine grained mechanisms within that domain. So if somebody is assessed across reward, cognitive control, negative valence and emotionality, the dysregulation or the dysfunction really stands out in negative emotionality, then perhaps it's worth saying, how can we do more targeted assessment, adapted testing to figure out which of the lower order mechanisms, so punishment, sensitivity, coping, negative emotionality, negative expectancies, how maybe are driving that dysfunction and negative emotionality. And that's important because it can allow us to kind of more effectively or more clearly target and test precision medicine hypotheses. So we can say, what, you know, for somebody that has a high amount of dysregulation and negative emotionality, specifically they have dysregulation in their coping abilities. How can we then use existing treatments, either specific to substance use disorder or transdiagnostic for any other diagnosis to target that mechanism? How can we help this person improve their coping so that this mechanism is perhaps decreased in terms of dysregulation and is driving less of the dysfunction. But what I really wanna highlight is that this is all really kind of idealistic at this point, right? So before these things that I'm describing here can really happen, what needs to occur first is that this conceptual framework, this hierarchical model really needs to be tested empirically and validated empirically. So that leads me to kind of what's next in this line of work and what I'm really hoping to continue doing here as part of the grand challenge and as part of my program of research long-term. So in terms of my personal next steps, I really want to start empirically testing and validating this framework. Um, I actually, interestingly enough, just, I submitted a, a K award to NIH in October and it was just uh, reviewed on Wednesday of this week. So I'm currently awaiting a score on that. But what that grant proposes to do is to start doing some of this testing and validation. What I've done to date is kind of develop items, self-report items that I think assess each of these mechanisms very clearly. And I've done what are known as cognitive interviewing, which is a qualitative methodology where you bring a participant in, you say, here's my item, tell me what that means to you. And you try to understand if these items are actually assessing the constructs that they're intended to assess. You're looking at the validity, the construct validity of your items. And especially in substance use disorder work, like some of the terminology we use is so outdated, participants don't understand it. So it gives you an opportunity to revise those items in a way that improves their construct validity and decreases your measurement error. So that's some of what I've done so far is really just trying to get a large item set that comprehensively assesses each of the mechanisms in this framework so that I can start to test this model. And my K award proposes to really extend that, to look at things like how do these items perform across diverse samples in terms of age, racial, ethnic identity, so on and so forth, to say, you know, can we really develop this battery that's comprehensive and that we can test across different groups of people um, to see if we can develop this testing instrument to do exactly what I described before, which would be to probe kind of lower lower levels of the hierarchy, depending on where somebody's dysfunction is. And of course, it's not that straightforward, right? There's probably overlap, like I mentioned, cross-loading. People can have dysfunction in all three domains. And then what do we do? Part of what I really would like to do longer term, hopefully after this K, is to start really testing some of the interventions that we have for substance use disorder to say, you know, I think this intervention acts upon this mechanism. Can we actually empirically test that? and see you know, if somebody high in negative emotionality receives this treatment that is supposed to act upon negative emotionality, can we reduce the negative emotionality 
and their subsequent risk. Um, so with that, thank you very much. I want to have plenty of questions for time, um, time for questions. Here's my contact information if you want to reach me. But again, um, I'm happy to take questions now, either um, raising of hands or in the chat. Let me stop sharing my screen here. I don't see anything in the chat, but I will hang tight for a second. Nice to see some faces. Hello. I'll start off with a little question, Cassie. Um, and I'm hardly an expert in this area, but it seems like alcohol use disorder has fall, fallen victim to the same thing that the trauma literature has, which is that the components of the diagnosis are disjunctive. So it creates a strong argument that uh, these are different things uh, as the components differ. And that, that I really believe that the simplification of the label is really done more to make the, the, the experts feel better or feel like it's the same thing than really explains what the problem is. I think there are 265 thousand different matches for PTSD, you've got the same problem with alcohol use disorder. So what, how, do, how, does, how does simplifying it help us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, part of the challenge is that we know that treatments for substance use disorders are you know, moderately effective at best. I think perhaps that's because we're not asking the right questions or testing the right questions, right? If, if there's so much heterogeneity within an alcohol use disorder, what makes us think that putting all people with an alcohol use disorder in this treatment trial is actually going to show us anything anything meaningful, right? right? And I think right. that's one of the things that I really like about our doc and that I really took from that was how can we group people based on how they're similar and then say, you know, do treatments work for these people, not for all people diagnosed with an alcohol use disorder? So I think if we can really operate at that super domain level as a starting point and say, you know, do all, do people with, you know, have, who have dysfunction and reward processes, do they benefit from this treatment and start to simplify it in that way. And it, again, it doesn't solve all the problems that we have with heterogeneity, with comorbidity, but perhaps it allows us to clarify the sources of the comorbidity, for example, you know, is it the reward related dysfunction that's causing this person to have both substance use disorder and depression? And can we act upon that mechanism? I think this really grew too out of my ex clinical experiences where oftentimes if you work in addiction, it's like this ongoing challenge of like, do they need addiction treatment first? Can they get like general mental health treatment first? Can you do both at the same time? Do they have to happen concurrently? <laughs> and so right. if we can act on these transdiagnostic mechanisms, we can really, I think, go much further in terms of how we're able to help people. And I've always felt that the, the, the reliance on disjunctive diagnostics serves the clinicians more than it really serves the patients. So that if you arrive at a diagnosis that somebody has PTSD, that's my area, and everybody goes, oh, oh yeah, well, actually that's not correct. It's not an oh yeah, because they could be entirely different presentations. Uh, you know, the mm -hmm. commonality is needed for the clinician, not for the patient. That's one of the big debates about this idea of compulsivity, because there's a lot of basic research showing that compulsivity is really relevant in alcohol use disorder and substance use disorders. But there are a lot of people who really operate from kind of these choice models of addiction, which says that actually the choice to use is rational. It's not a compulsion that people can't control. Um, so again, I, 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 there's, you know, if you're walking into someone's office who really thinks that compulsivity is the main component or challenge in addiction, because that's what the DSM says, um, you know, perhaps those people are not best served. If, you know, if choice really is playing a role here, perhaps we need different interventions. Well, I don't see any other questions. You want to hang on for a while or? Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to hang out if anyone else has questions or thoughts or comments. Happy to, to chat. Thank 
There's Martin. He's my uh, research assistant. <laughs> Hello. I have so many questions, but I think maybe I'll ask you during our meeting because <laughs> you can ask me now wanna... if you want. You can ask now. Okay. One question I have is of these. What was it? Thirteen categories. Do you have a prediction for like which the most common treatments um, are addressing or acting upon? Mm, that's a really good question. And I don't know that I have a good answer. I could tell you which I think is perhaps the most relevant domain in addiction. Um, yeah. I think largely negative emotionality actually. Um, Katie Wickowitz, who's also at CASA, she just um, published a paper showing that when we look at the, those three domains from the alcohol addiction RDOC or the ANA, mm -hmm. we see that the domain that best predicts recovery is actually negative emotionality. So people that were high in negative emotionality had worse recovery outcomes and people that were lower and it had better outcomes. So that's telling me, you know, this is maybe a really key process that we need to be intervening on with our treatments treatments, a lot of different treatments for substance use disorders, I think do address components of negative emotionality in some way. Um, but yeah, I do think that that's perhaps a really key process. And we could look at like mindfulness-based interventions, for example, um, coping skills even, you know, like, um, yeah, I think more kind of modular dynamic treatment approaches could be really useful when we think about a framework like this. If, we, if we're able to gather this information from the people we work with, we could pr probably tailor them more appropriately. Yeah. Looks like you have a question from Dr. Romo, so. Oh, go ahead. Hi, I'm your neighbor over at ASAP. Hi. I like the presentation. I, I was more of a comment. I like, I like it because it seems to increase the the specificity and reflect the complexity of addiction a lot more than just slapping everybody with the 11 criteria. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's kind of like the DSM-5 is kind of like painting by numbers and this is more, more of like a Rembrandt. And so the more it can be tailored to an individual, mm -hmm. the better results that clinicians will usually get. And it, it's important for disease states that are ubiquitous that can affect all domains of a of a person's life. So th thank you for doing this kind of work. Yeah, thank you so much for your comment. I think one of the things I really like about this too is, you know, the history of psychiatry and the history of classification, reputation isn't the best, right? Like there's been, in thinking about who's been in charge making these decisions about what is what is pathologized, what is not pathologized. Again, we carry with ourselves biases, right? That inevitably impact the work we're doing. So what I really like about a mechanistic focus is that we can really like uh, tackle that head on and kind of get rid of some of the other like psychosocial components that might be at play that could, you know, again, be more like secondary processes um, that aren't actually caused by somebody's alcohol use disorder. So when you think about things like legal problems, which used to be in the DSM-4, there's pretty strong evidence based that, for example, black men are more likely to endorse that criterion, not because they're experiencing it more, but because they're more likely to experience legal consequences. That's not a reflection of their alcohol use always, right? So if we can really target the mechanisms, which perhaps are more objective, I don't wanna say with certainty because we still have to assess them some way. And if we're gonna assess them with self-report, you know, we run into similar challenges, but I really do think there's something here in terms of kind of moving away from some of the things that we've faced in classification, like racism. Yeah, thank you, doctor. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Well, it looks like we have exhausted the questions, Cassie. So uh, uh, I really wanna thank you for doing this. Uh, I've uh, loved watching your career. So you, you, uh, we appreciate your taking the time and sometime soon, we will definitely drag you back in. <laughs> it would be my pleasure. Okay, thank you. Thanks everyone.